How can something as ugly and repulsive as a torture device we call the cross be called beautiful? It's not perfectly proportionate. It's not made by a great designer. Gucci was not designing crosses for the Romans, and yet we speak of the beauty of the cross. Well, today I have two questions I want to ask and then try to answer. The first is, what do we really mean when we say the cross is beautiful? And second, how should this deeper kind of beauty influence our art and our creative choices as artists? I want to suggest to you there is a deeper beauty which the cross of Christ points to, and if we understand this properly, it will change the way we think about beauty and about art. Welcome, I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts and Entertainment Ministries, and our passion is helping you as a creative professional to succeed in your creative life while growing deeper in your spiritual walk. Because your creativity and your spirituality were designed by God to be integrated with each other. God did not call us to compartmentalize our work over here and our creativity over there separately from our faith. He designed them to work in concert with one another, and that's our passion. If that's your passion, take a second, hit the like, and subscribe to our channel. Share it with your friends. We're so glad you're with us. Oh, and before we jump in, I want to let you know we have online courses for you about your calling as an artist, about theology and art in our institute, and a course called Catalyst, which teaches you about being an entrepreneur in the art world and entertainment industry. Those links are all down below if you want to check them out. Now let's jump in. Now I want to suggest to you that there's a deeper beauty which the cross of Christ points to. And if we understand this properly, it will deepen our love not only for Jesus and what he did, but it will also give us a new sort of depth to our aesthetics and some new perspectives on what things we should be pursuing as artists and creatives. Now first, what do we mean by beauty and how can that be seen in the cross, right? Beauty is the word we use to describe things or actions or performances that help us delight in them or give us pleasure. So we find pleasure in something, we call it beautiful. And if our hearts and minds are attuned properly, we find pleasure in good things. We find pleasure in health, not disease. We find delight and pleasure in the beauty of loving relationships, not abusive relationships. And we'll find beauty in healthy communities, not manipulative communities or cults or those kinds of controlling environments. Those will be repulsive and ugly and disgusting to us. And we will find truth beautiful and goodness beautiful. Now the cross is physically a symbol of torture and of death. It's something we might describe more specifically as grotesque. It's the opposite of beautiful. In one sense, it represents shame, as they strip people naked before putting them on the cross. It also represents punishment, as it was the most severe way to punish thieves and murderers. These men were tortured, stripped, mocked, and humiliated. So how can this be beautiful, right? We can't just call it beautiful because we want to, any more than we can call it modern or abstract or cubist, because we feel like it. No, these words have meanings. As Shakespeare wrote in Romeo and Juliet, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would still smell as sweet. Of course, Shakespeare is saying changing the word we use to describe something does not change the thing itself. In other words, we cannot just call the cross beautiful and pretend that all the ugliness has disappeared because of our great linguistic skills or machinations. No, the cross will always be ugly. So, how can we sing worship songs about the glory of the cross, the beauty of the cross? Some would say, well, Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. That's wonderful, but it's still ugly. It'd be hard to watch. It's not beautiful. If you ever seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, you realize how disturbing and grotesque and hard to watch the entire event must have been. You may say, well, Jesus was the atonement for our sins, paid for our sins. That's true, and it is wonderful, but that is not what makes it beautiful. What is beautiful is not the method by which Christ was killed. What is beautiful is the love, compelled desire of Christ to sacrifice his own life willingly for you and me. You see, the fact that someone who is noble, good, and true would look at us and choose to die for our sins is hard to fathom. We did not earn it. We did not deserve such love. And yet, the God of the universe went through great pain and suffering to give us life. If we understand it properly, this is what takes our breath away. What is beautiful is not physical nature of the cross. What is beautiful is the spiritual act of sacrificial love of the most amazing kind. For this is not merely a friend dying for a friend. It's not even a king 
dying for a fellow nobleman or even for one of his own people, though that's what the Greeks thought would be the most beautiful and noble act in history, is for a noble person to die for someone else. But this is not an earthly king. This is the king above all kings, the lord above all lords, the one who rules the heavens. It's that king, the one who has the most majesty, honor, and glory, the one who has the most to give up, the most to sacrifice, and to be killed by the people he created, to be killed, scorned, crucified, so that he could redeem those very people. This is love like we've never seen or heard before. And we're not nobles. We're not the most righteous. Christ came to save sinners such as you and me, who are messed up, who have failed over and over. We're the misfits of creation. We screwed it up. We can understand dying for a good man or woman, but to die for Saul, who is killing Christians, and redeem him so that he might become the Apostle Paul? Or to die for a slave trader like John Newton, and use him and William Wilberforce to stop slave trading. What kind of God would die for those people? A God that has more love than we can fathom. A God that will go to greater extremes to demonstrate that love than we ever could imagine. The one true God who will do whatever it takes to redeem his people, even if it means death. How could such a king die for you and me? It's only possible if you possessed a love for you and me that was so powerful, so overwhelming, so unrestrained, and so unending that he would do anything to redeem us, to restore us, to be reunited with us. A God so bent on finding any way that we might have communion with him. This is what touches our hearts and brings tears to our eyes when we understand it. You see, it's a deeper beauty of love than we rarely talk about, but deeply long for it's the height of beauty. It is the true beauty of which all fairy tales, great novels, and films are just echoes. J.R.R. Tolkien said, The gospel is the one true myth because it's based in reality. It actually happened. While all other myths are clouded echoes of this story. God's redemptive love demonstrated for you and me. That's the one true story of love that we can count on. Now, we see it in other places, whether it is the love expressed in the movie Braveheart by a man who's heartbroken over the murder of his bride, or the love expressed in the movie The Notebook, where love transcends time and even dementia, or novels of Jane Austen, or even the tragic tale of Romeo and Juliet. Both are willing to die for the other, and it ends tragically. Um, but that willingness to die for one another, to sacrifice yourselves, this moves our hearts. All these stories touch our souls, awaken our hearts, and remind us of our longing to be loved so passionately and with such commitment that someone might die for us. That is the one thing we deeply long for, even if we have become cynical about it. A love that is true and a friend who will do anything to express and demonstrate and prove that love for us. In all other fairy tales and epic poems and grand movies that grip our hearts do so because they're echoing this one true love and this overwhelmingly powerful act in history. This is the most beautiful act. This is the love we waited for our whole lives. It's a love that melts our hearts, washes away our shame, and restores our soul. This is the beauty that delights our hearts, speaks to our hearts, saying, you are treasured, you are mine. You see, this is the deeper spiritual beauty of which the lilies and the waterfalls are mere echoes. Sure, they give us pleasure, they're lovely to look at, but they cannot rescue a sinner's heart or mend the soul. Only the love of Christ can do that. So that leads us to our second question. If we believe that surface beauty is only an echo of the deeper beauty of sacrificial love, then we will consider how our creative projects might reflect more than great design more than simply be lovely to look at. That's great, even if we're making art that is more like the voice of the prophet and we're seeking to wake people up from their slumber, it will be well-designed and provocative, and that's good. But what is our end goal? Well, I think it should be twofold. First, we should create wonderful, well-designed works of art, a given. Secondly, we should be looking for ways to point to the deeper beauty of God's never-ending, always pursuing sacrificial love for us and for others. We'll be asking, how can we in our artwork be an aroma of Christ's love, such that women and men are drawn to see this deeper beauty of God's love? If we're never pursuing this, do we really understand the gospel? Are we really obeying the call to be salt and light? And are we using our gifts to honor 
the gift giver, the one who gave us these gifts. You know, our life was redeemed so we might share the beauty of that redemption with others. For our words, our deeds, our families, our artwork, the media we create, and the entertainment we produce. So, the beauty of the cross lies not so much in the cross itself, or the design, or even in the grain and the finish of the cross, of course. No, the beauty comes from the never-ending love of God that is so deep, so wholly committed to rescuing sinners that God is willing to pay the highest price to sacrifice his life to redeem the ones who need it most. Nothing is more moving. Nothing is more deeply beautiful to our soul. We see in Philippians 2, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of his man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And here's the result. Here's the impact. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the result of great sacrificial love by our God for us. Now, it's your turn. What are you going to do to echo that kind of beauty? Tell me what you think of this approach to the beauty of the cross. Is it compelling? Is it satisfying? What else would you add to kind of flush this out even more, to make it even more impactful or practical for your art? Now, I really, I love to get your comments, interact with them. And while you're there, please take a second, subscribe, and hit the like button. And if you enjoyed this, I urge you to check out our website and our online courses by clicking one of the links below. As always, I pray that God may bless you and equip you to be salt and light in this dark world that desperately needs it. Before you go, we have another video for you right here.